Happy day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Better Catholics. Once again, I'm Father Melvin. I'm Bishop Ryan. I'm Father Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Father Nelson, for coming to uh, the island of Saipan, all the way from Rhoda. You know, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, how was the trip? Oh, it's a good uh, <laughs> trip, but uh, was it scary <laughs> or no, bumpy not, or anything? Not, not. Okay, nice. all right, that's good. The, the thing is, you're here, and that's what matters. Because we're going to talk about your religious order. You know, maybe you can enlighten us with the, the religious order, the nature, the charism, a little bit of history of, of uh, the religious order in general, and also the history of the religious order of the uh, order of the Augustinian Reclex here in Saipan. <laughs> But maybe before that, I just would yeah. like to thank Father Nelson for saying yes when you uh, were given the assignment to come here. Mm, so you. he is the uh, newest, the latest addition to oh. our clergy assigned to the island of Rhoda, uh, San Francisco de Borja and San Isidro. Mm -hmm. So Father Nelson and Father Jefferson are there. So I hope and pray that so far life in Rhoda has been good and that you are doing well, enjoying uh, your time with people and uh, uh, if there's any need or problem that you have just call Father Melvin <laughs> <laughs> no no, I'll call the I, bishop <laughs> <laughs> thank you bishop for the trust and uh, your love for us mm. thank you okay so Father Nelson tell us something about the, the history of of the uh, Augustinian Recollects okay so we commonly known as uh, Recoletos or yeah. OAR, Order of Augustinian Recollects. Uh, the Order of Augustinian Recollects started 1588 in Spain. Okay. Originally, it was uh, a group of OSA, Order of St. Augustine Friars, mm -hmm. right. the original mother congregation. Mm -hmm that they wanted to leave out the most uh, like a uh, Oster kind of life mm. to bring back the original spirit of the order mm. to live a more strict kind of life, uh, stricter kind of life or way of life that uh, some of the members are quite uh, not practicing it anymore. Mm. So this group of Friars decided to form a group mm. aside from this original group, mm -hmm. and that was in 1588. 1588. In, uh, yeah, if we try to recall on the history, the group of these Augustinian friars wanted to leave out the collective charism of the order to live a life of renewed fervor and renew norms of the service of the church. So the chapter of the province of Castile in Toledo, Spain in 1588, determined that uh, in a certain houses of the province, this new manner of life would be lived. Mm -hmm. So they, they started the group. So that's why there's the conflict between the original members. Right, right. Because they don't like that some of the members are going to separate from them. Well, in fact, you're actually simply going back to the original yeah. design, to the back to the rule. And this yes. rule is based on the rule of St. Augustine. St. Augustine. Yes. Okay. Can you tell us something about the uh, uh, nature of austerity in, yes. in the rule of St. Augustine? Uh, they are living in poverty and living in community mm. as one Very community. Important. Yes. But uh, because of some abuses, of, shall we say, abuses of the some of the friars, they don't live in the community mm. anymore. And they also don't practice anymore the vow of poverty. Mm. So that's the reason why this group started to bring back the original spirit of the order. 
What is the importance or the value of observing those vows, especially nowadays in this modern world, when you talk about poverty, uh, I think the younger generation will probably um, say, oh, is that the kind of life I'm going to get into if I join the Augustinian Recollects or the Adorno Fathers, the religious congregation? But perhaps you can shed light to us on what, what does poverty really mean in light of your spirituality and how you actually live your life as a priest and especially being assigned in Rhoda. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, if we, as religious, I can speak personally on my experience. It's very important to live out the vow of poverty as a religious because according to St. Augustine, poverty is like living what is in common, the gift that God gave you in common. So you're not living alone as you are just to fulfill your needs, right. but you're thinking of the good of the community. So, and this, if we try to observe faithfully the vow of poverty, we can say that we can control ourselves, discipline ourselves for the many things around the world, especially today's life of the young people. That's this ex experience or the influence of the high technologies mm -hmm. and this material world is very sad. But if we have that vow of poverty and faithfully practicing that vow, mm -hmm. we can surely make ourselves become more safe yes. from this temptation of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and everything is, for example, just like the Adorno, the Jesuits, uh, the uh, OAR in our diocese, uh, the sense of community. So whatever gifts, for example, that you receive, it doesn't belong to you personally, yes. but to the community. Yes. And uh, with you and Father Jefferson, you have a system, a way of doing things in such a way that even little things like, you know, you need this kind of item, you know, you express this desire to have this, then everything is decided as a community. And yes. there's a value in that as opposed to, oh, I need it. I have, you know, the allowance. I just get it. That's the, the other way of living as religious. Mm -hmm. We are sharing in common what we have as we receive from the community, like the allowances, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the gift. So we share that in common. It's actually rooted also in scriptures, right? Wasn't it St. Paul in yes, one of his right. writings that, right. you know, everything was for, for the community and, and, you know, it doesn't belong to him, but for, for the needs of, of, of others. Yes. Yeah. The members of the church sold their properties and put everything yeah. together common. in one in common. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I really, I am blessed. And that's why I, I always count on uh, the assistance, the collaboration of religious congregations in our diocese, because we don't have enough diocesan priests. We don't even have current local vocations, but with Especially, you know, the, the, the OER, the CRM, the Adorno Fathers, you know, you have been helping us in so many ways. And not only in terms of ministry, in terms of serving the needs of the people, but also giving good examples to brother priests. So there's always that critique that Hopefully. if you're a diocesan <laughs> priest, you know, you are prone towards you know, the, the material things, no? But I guess there's also that invitation for us to live simply and hopefully with the way you live your lives in poverty, in the spirit of community, there's something that we can also learn you know, from, from you. Right. And it is something that St. Augustine really dreamt of having in, the, in his diocese to bring all his priests together to live in common. That mm. is why the rule of St. Augustine evolved into that. Yeah, and and the the priest found was found it really wise to have that sense of support from brother yes. priests um, for check and balances also and really guidance. So it's good that uh, we have the rule of Saint Augustine. Uh, on the, on the context of poverty, though, 
Uh, we have different kinds of expressions or how we follow poverty. In your case, you are a mendicant order by design. Yeah. Yes. And uh, by definition, when you say you are a mendicant um, order, it means that you really Bigger. trust in the providence of God through the grace that flows uh, from other people. I mean, through other people uh, to, the, to the order, meaning... Yeah. You're basically beggars, you know, uh, yes. of God's graces. Um, so how is that working for you as, uh, is it still the same, you know, uh, practice? Actually in the 16th century, you know, after the, for the formation of the new group, mm. it was called the Congregation mm. of Augustinian Recollect. They called themselves mendicants mm -hmm. because starting from the scratch, you don't have any. So they go to the streets, the markets, and begging for food mm -hmm. with bare food. Mm -hmm. So they are just dependent on God, yes. the grace of God. Mm -hmm. But then later on, the because we have the so-called uh, sign of the times, right. the development of the congregations and it became order already. So they started to remove the word mendicant from the group, but originally speaking, it is mendicant. Mm -hmm. Because why? Uh, people give their support to the congregation, to the order, mm -hmm. and started from that time, the congregation was uh, able to get some support and uh, right. started the community and their fund for the community. Mm -hmm. So they are not begging anymore. Right. But it is very specific in the community that we still need to practice poverty. Poverty, yes. But our poverty is not the poverty like the poverty of St. Francis of Assisi. Mm -hmm. Ours is on how to manage the common good for the community. So we have right. we have things in common, but mm. not our own as Correct. personal. Correct. That's for the community. Mm. Like say, for example, we have schools and universities. Right. There's some people asking you people, you Augustine <laughs> Recollects, <laughs> telling that you are practicing the vow of poverty. But how come do you have <laughs> many schools universities yes. and properties and enrollment too is not really cheap <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> uh, so that that is a question of, of a lot of people actually you know i've heard that a lot and if you are active in social media you will every once in a while you will see young people uh commenting on that uh, religious people having the vows of poverty and this and that but you guys are rich <laughs> you know <laughs> Uh, but they have no, uh, they don't really understand the nature of, of the properties that religious communities have. And it's not really for their own, uh, uh, say, we don't, because we want to accumulate more and more uh, wealth and treasures. But it is always for, for people to benefit from. It's, it's not really for, for me or for you, but it's for for the apostolate. Yes. yes. I look at it too as a way really an expression of stewardship. Right. The way you live your lives as a religious priest, which we, the diocesan priests, are not exempted. We also mm. are called to be good stewards. Correct. And that expression of stewardship is through the life of poverty mm. that you have just explained. Mm. And in the same token for us, then how can we be good stewards also right. of what has been given to us with the underlying principle that Everything that we have and all that we are, these are all gifts from God. Correct. And so how do we take good care, take re responsibility right. yes. over these gifts that have been given to us? That's a beautiful way of, you know, explaining how poverty works in the, in the religious order, particularly uh, to the order of the Augustinian yeah. Recollects. Yes. So, wow, thank you for enlightening us, enlightening us with your um, explanation. Um, you've been here in Saipan. I mean, the, the order has been here in Saipan for how many years, Bishop? I believe 
Officially, they started in 2016 because 2016. I recall when I was ordained bishop in 2016, Father Neil arrived a few days before that. But prior to that, I uh, um, uh, made a request, uh, I believe a year or two years before that. Mm-hmm. So prior to uh, 2016, there have been uh, OER priests who've come here and helped for a month or a few months. And then uh, I also recall that there was, uh, you know, a series of consultation, ocular visit. Mm-hmm. And just like with, uh, before you came in here, you know, there's right. always that process that, that comes beforehand. So I'm, I'm grateful for the OER and mm-hmm. I'm glad that, uh, you know, they uh, uh, send you to to uh, the Dice Chell in Kanoa and Rhoda, and I hope you have no regrets or yeah. how you feel right now. <laughs> you feel like you want to pack your bags and go home and tell the new superior, I want to go somewhere else. It's a blessing. Are you happy in Rhoda? Yeah, very happy. Uh, actually, Rhode Island is the best place for mm. a religious. Correct. Ah, yes. Because we can practice really our vow, Yeah. Poverty, just and it. even community and even, yes. <laughs> yeah. but sad to say our community is not yet complete right right they are just two because mm. our community usually a small community consists of three At religious mm. if a big community like school universities and uh, formation houses more or less 10 mm. or 15 but maybe hopefully this year Yeah, yes. maybe you can shed light on us about that because it's the same with the Adorno Fathers and even with the Pastorelli Sisters that at least there are three members to kind of to comprise a, a community, right? Why not two? Is I, I know like the Jesuits, they they don't really have that ruling. There are those assignments that it's just one, but for most, if not, you know, all in you know, the majority of the uh, religious congregations, There's got to be three members in a community. Practic- practically speaking, maybe the ideal of community is the Trinity. Mm-hmm. The Father, Son, and Spirit. So three persons always in communion, mm-hmm. in unity. So that's the beauty of the community, at least three. Because if a brother has a problem, With the he other. has a companion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He has already a companion in the community to share. So he will never go anywhere if he wants to talk to somebody. Mm-hmm. Tell us a bit about what does a typical day in Rhoda look like for the Agustinian Recollects? This is Father Nelson's schedule. <laughs> so, yeah, so that our listeners will have an idea also yes. how you concretize your life as a religious priest with a particular assignment in the island of Rhoda. And uh, who knows, some of our listeners might be inspired to consider uh, their religious life. And and you mentioned about Rhoda being an ideal place for religious life. Actually, our we are two in the community. So we divided our schedule morning of evening masses. So one prior or religious in the morning, one in the evening. And then the schedule of the baptism, the wedding, and other sacramental activities, we divided that. We have the, the calendar for the month. So that uh, if we have some like apostolate in the area visiting the sick, we take turns. So that's what we are now doing as uh, two members in the community. So we have the prayer schedule every day. Then we have our apostolate and office work. So we'll take turns. Do you feel like you're not doing enough or you're doing a lot? Uh, you can complain to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's not like uh, doing a lot or enough. It's a matter of time. Management, management and uh, willingness to do the apostolate or the work. Right. I also believe it's not so much about the quantity, what have you done, X, Y, Z, but the quality, kind of, you know, the Greek concept of time 
right? It's a it's not the Kronos like from six to six p.m. Right. But the Kairos, the concept of oh, this particular encounter with you know a single mother who just lost her job and that particular time you spent with a person is is more than enough isn't it that's the beauty of our ministry like we don't need unlike for example in 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 line of business like productivity is measured by you know how much you have actually produced and you know what is the dollar sign and whether we're losing or gaining but i believe in 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 matters of 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 uh, uh pastoral ministry spiritual life it's not quantifiable that way. And then, for example, like, you know, it you have also to prepare for your homilies. You have to have time for study and reflection. So it's not all about being out there doing something. It's more of being rather than all of those things that, you know, is expected in a in a, in in a, in a regular person. Like you have to have a loaded calendar. I don't know if you agree with that, right? Yeah. You know, you don't feel guilty like, oh, okay. I have to do something, but you know, but just being there and then making your time productive by by doing the things that will help you in your ministry. Yeah, this, that's, this is a parish ministry, uh, but in its original design, it, was it always a parish ministry kind of apostolate that you have in the order? Yeah, yes, actually, we have uh, four apostolates. Mm -hmm. We have the formation seminaries, schools, mm -hmm. we have the parishes, we have the mission, mm -hmm. and uh, we have the, the the pastoral or the parish, no? Mm -hmm. Parochial, school, mission, and formation. Mm -hmm. So these are our four uh, apostolates. That's why we are also being prepared, at least, to be ready for the mm -hmm. parochial assignment because we have parishes talking about formation can you share with us how many candidates for the priesthood how many are waiting for ordination seminarians or what is the 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 state of you know a religious uh, vocation in your congregation at the moment is it increasing decreasing or just kind of steady actually it's not um usually the since mm -hmm. Back five to ten years ago, there are always more vocations entering in the recollects. Mm. But in the college years, philosophy, more or less, there are 70. Mm. With the senior high school, more or less, we have 50 and uh, less than 100, no, mm. total. But later on, towards the other formation, after college, they went out. So only very few will proceed for the for the further uh, formation. Say so fifty percent will yes. continue. Okay. Like us, our group is thirty six. Mm -hmm. We ordained thirteen. Of us. Oh, you're so one of the 13. Yes. And how many years in the priesthood now, Father Nelson? Uh, six years. All right. Six years. And okay. going stronger. <laughs> stronger <laughs> as ever. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very nice. That's very nice. At least you have 13 in your batch that really pushed through with the, uh, yes. with the program, with the process and really professed their vows and became religious, uh, not only religious priests, but really uh, functioning uh, and uh, devoted religious members. Um, the the charism of your uh, order. Uh, can you enlighten us with the <laughs> the charism? charism. We, we always ask about the charism of the order because uh, it's it's part of it. You know, we have the charism that we have to uh, that as our guiding principle. Actually, every religious congregation right. has a charism, but when we say charism, is the way of life. Right. The way of life that we practice as a congregation. Mm -hmm. So we have a specific way of life for every congregation mm -hmm. or order. So ours is a com community, communitarian. Mm -hmm. So that's our, like, uh, the highlight of being the recollects, mm -hmm. to live in common. 
the community. That's the that's the charism that we really highlighted for us to become uh, faithful to the original plan of Saint Augustine of living in common. Mm -hmm. So we are trying Frater fraternal fraternal living. fraternal living. Yeah. yeah. So that's it. Mm -hmm. So we have also the we so called the com contemplative contemplative and active mm -hmm. way of life. We have uh, we have some contemplative sisters members, but we also we consider ourselves contemplative because we have the obligation to really practice our prayer life in the, in the convent. So we have the scheduled every day for our prayer, morning until evening, mm -hmm. aside from our pastoral work. So living in a com community in common with uh, practicing our prayer life. Mm -hmm. That's the contemplative way of being a recollect. And also active is we have the apostolate, like the paro parochial apostolate and the school apostolate. Mm -hmm. We go for mission. Right. So like in our school apostolate, we have big universities, but we have plenty also of our scholars. Mm -hmm. Because one way of the recollects is to help the poor students to finish their studies for free. Everything is free. Mm -hmm. So in the Philippines, our school, the Recoletos uh, school uh, reads, Recoletos Educational Apostolate. Mm -hmm. So thousands of students are being uh, scholars yeah. wow. of our school. So wow. that's one way of our charism to help also the needy students. Mm -hmm. And that is why people give generously to the to the order uh, and accumulate wealth because you give it away yeah. also. That's very nice. Yeah. Father Nelson, I, I know you you have just described to us the specific charism, but I want to have perhaps, you know, like kind of a, give us a window to your soul. Mm. Uh, personally, in your six years as a priest, what has been the most challenging, whether it's living at one of those charisms or the vows? And uh, uh, what, what has been the most challenging, if there is? Okay. So maybe the challenging is the observing, observing of the vows. Which vow particularly, Father? <laughs> Obedience. Obedience. No, 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 I'm just not, joking. I just said it out. <laughs> Obedience is not the uh, It's not difficult, question right? Question for the yeah. Reflex. Because we are really, if the superior will assign you to this place, no question. Really? You follow, you yes. obey. Is it like that with the diocesan priest, Father Melvin? <laughs> I have no clue. You have no idea. Continue. <laughs> but yeah. uh, sometimes the, the chastity, that's the most difficult one. Because we need to be to leave out our vow of chastity, not only celibacy, to right. be celibate. Like the can you make the distinction, celibacy and 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 chastity in simple terms and why yeah. you express that living out or observing the vow of chastity is one is uh, the most challenging for you yeah uh i think the the diocesan are practicing the celibacy right but the celibacy they are uh they are not allowed to get married no as a priest but sometimes there are priests who are not yet really faithful to become celibate. Celibate means uh, you are not engaged in some mm. indecent relationship. But some of the priests are falling into indecent relationship. Mm. So they disobeyed. They violated their, their uh, so-called celibate life. But the recollect or the, uh, the religious are practicing the chastity. Right. Chastity is to become chaste, 
not only in the flesh, in carnal desire, but also in the heart and in the mind. And that has been for yourself the most challenging. Yes, because it's more heavier than the celibate, the celibacy, the chastity. The purity of the mind. The purity. The purity yeah. of the mind, the purity of the heart, the purity of the soul. It's just yes. yeah. almost impossible to, uh, you know, by a regular human person, yeah. you know, yes. to really accomplish. Because once so, you're ordained, you don't become less of a human. You right. Know, the desires are still there. Yeah. And so if that is a challenge, how do you address that? Uh, how, how, what, what could be perhaps, you know, your ways of, of controlling or addressing that in a healthy way? Actually, that's very important to really, if you're a religious, you're also a man of prayer. Mm -hmm. Because prayer is the only weapon mm -hmm. that we can sustain our religious and priestly life. Mm -hmm. Also to protect us from the temptation of the flesh, like St. Paul says, mm -hmm. the turn of the flesh. This is actually, we are human. Right. And that fleshly desire is always with us. So in order to fight that temptation, that carnal desire is through prayer. To indulge ourselves in prayers, our close relationship with Jesus. And one very important aspect too of your charism helps a lot in the uh, uh, to compensate the, the carnal uh, desire which is the fraternal spirit. You know, you have, because um, perhaps psychologically we, we desire for, for relationship, mm -hmm. you know, and we seek it in, in other mm -hmm. forms. Mm -hmm. But with, with the help of your brothers in the mm -hmm. community, that desire somehow is compensated. Yes. So you have your brother you know, making you a cup of coffee. That mm -hmm. is something that, people somehow long for, you know, yeah. someone who serves you, but not in that extra, you know, yes. uh, carnal way, but really in a fraternal way, you know, compensated. That's, that's the, the beauty of the charism that you have with fraternal uh, Com spirit, fraternal communion, fraternal living. So, and I guess it's always a dynamics of gift and task. You have been given this gift to live out this vocation. And so the task is, you know, as you have said, living in fraternal uh, uh, communion, communion. And, and, and just perhaps, you know, uh, engaging also in, in healthy activities, you know, right, uh, pick yes, up right. a hobby, surround yourselves with good people. Right. And perhaps friends that you can share your thoughts, you know, the recent books you've read. And and uh, do sports, you yes. know, do something, redirect your energy into something more fruitful, something more wholesome, rather than giving in to those desires that you've shared yeah. earlier. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, I think we're getting more into that. So uh, <laughs> let's uh, get back into that. <laughs> yeah, well, we have a lot more questions to you, Father Nelson. And I wish we could invite Father uh, Jefferson also one day, uh, someday, and uh, ask him also about his experience in the island uh, as a religious, uh, as a religious missionary, as a priest. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time. Yeah, yeah. but we are looking forward to uh, our next encounter with you here in in this uh, program. Um, again, thank you very much and for taking time uh, yeah. to spend with okay. us. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, do another session for a conversation about this so that we can make uh, people, more people aware of the Augustinian Recollects, about the life of a religious, and hopefully inspire other people to become better Catholics. <laughs>